Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Valley Transportation. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is also brought to you by AgDirect. No matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast number 254. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Also, Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer auction or a private party, ag direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Well, this edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is a cool one. Uh, Aimpoint Research has been uh, on the podcast previously. I had Brett Scottio on, and also Brett sp- sp- has spoke at the Moving Iron Summit uh, this last year in Nashville, Tennessee. And I uh, have the honor to have Greg Dowd on here as part of uh, Aimpoint Research to talk about what's going on in Ukraine. So, Greg, how you doing, man? Hey, just fine. How are you? Doing good, bud. Well, Greg, there's a brief list. Let's do this real quick. Give a little bit of background about yourself and uh, kind of what you do at Aimpoint Research. You bet. I'm uh, just a farm boy from Jewel County, north central Kansas, uh, Mankato area, mm-hmm. and a uh, K-Stater. And I've been back in D.C. now uh, just almost 30 years uh, as an economist for the wheat industry, chief economist for the cattlemen. Back in the day, Senate Ag Committee, uh, di- different things as a commodity analyst in my career. But recently, I was uh, uh, the chief agricultural negotiator in the office of the U.S. Trade Representative uh, in the Trump administration. So I was the guy that negotiated the, the China deal and Japan and USMCA and and a lot of other things there for three years. And now I've been uh, for the last year with Aimpoint Research. Right on. Okay. Jewel County implement, man. And it's case dealership there. I know some guys up there. So that's uh yeah. go way back there a little bit, but that's uh that's one of those guys I used to call on a long time ago. So from yeah, those are good guys. We we had green yeah. paint at our house, but Did you? Uh, nothing, okay. nothing right wrong on. with those guys in Jewel. Yeah. Right on. Right on. <laughs> All right. Well, Greg, let's talk a little bit about what's going on here in, in uh, the whole Black Sea region. You got you know the whole Ukraine Ukraine uh Russia situation that we have. Uh it's They've had a couple opportunities to talk about some ceasefire stuff, and they can't come to an agreement. Um, and it's still, it's still, you know, war still raging over there in uh, in Ukraine right now, and that's had a big effect on what we see happen in the marketplace. So, you know, obviously, commodity markets are all over the place. Huge interday volatility, day to day volatility. It's just crazy, especially when you look at wheat because that's of, of what coming out of that area primarily. And you start looking at sunflower oil and those kind of things that come out of that area as well. Um, iron ore, all the stuff, key components to fertilizer. I mean, there's just so many things that come out of Ukraine that, and, and Russia as well, coming out of the Black Sea that a lot of people I don't think really knew what was there to, to come out of that area. So sending ripple effects across the market in such a, such a big manner that it's hard to keep track day to day what's going on. So I guess in a, in a real brief synopsis, I guess, as you take a look at what's going on there, what are your thoughts and how, how do you see this rippling across you know, the rest of 22. Well, in the ag commodity space, you you referenced it. So mm-hmm. most people don't realize that the Ukraine actually exports more wheat today than the United States does. Yeah. They're about 24 million tons. The U.S. is about 22. 
Uh, and uh, Russia is a much bigger exporter than that at about uh, 33 or so million tons. And so the, the situation right now on wheat and the reason it's so volatile is that's about 30% of all the wheat traded in the world. It comes mm -hmm. out of uh, those two countries and, and a big chunk of it, the most of it comes through the Black Sea. And right now there, there's a couple of components of that that affect all commodities, whether it's fertilizer or, or uh, grains or oil seeds coming out of that part of the world is no self-respecting vessel owner is going to take their vessel into that those waters. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, three vessels have been hit in this process already. Uh, and in case of the uh, Ukrainian uh, ports, the Ukrainian Navy, not the Russians, but the Ukrainian Navy mined their own ports to keep the Russians from uh, coming in there to, to potentially do damage to those ports. And these are very modern ports uh, operated by ADM, Bungie, Cargill. Dreyfus has been there for many, many decades. Uh, these are as modern and, and uh, good of ports as anything that we have in the United States. Um, and uh, if, if the fact that these ports are shut down, nothing going in or out right now is a major issue for the trade in wheat, uh, corn, and sunflower seed oil. Uh, most people don't realize that we actually uh, trade more sunflower seed oil in the world than we do soybean oil. So, and, and uh, with corn, uh, that's a, a major player in corn as well. So the, the biggest thing right now is the ports are down and you're not getting anything in or out of there. Uh, and, and now potentially you could send some stuff. And I think you, you're seeing some signs that the Russians want to try to figure out a way to get some wheat out of there, uh, you know, going a different direction by rail. Uh, that's possible. We'll, uh, we'll see what shakes out there. Uh, the biggest thing I think folks are talking about now is how long this lasts because um, you've got what six eight or ten weeks to get a crop in the ground in that part of the world uh, and then if, if we don't uh, you will have nothing coming out of that part of the world for uh, more than the next year so that that is the big issue is, is how is a Ukrainian farmer going to get anything planted when he doesn't have any diesel fuel mm -hmm. and and how do you get diesel fuel in there uh, when your ports are shut down you have to bring it in by truck and uh, how many bridges you have to do that. These are all really serious complications. On, on the steel side of the equation, I'm not really sure uh, how much steel comes out of that part of the world. Uh, you know, when I think of steel today, I think of China and the fact that uh, China has got more steel capacity than U.S. consumption. So that, and that's one of the big reasons that uh, in the Trump administration, uh, there were tariffs put on uh, Chinese steel and aluminum because they they really didn't care if they took the price of steel or aluminum to zero. They were only interested in running their facilities in China, and and uh, it was having a real negative influence on on uh, the prices of those commodities and and U.S. producers of those uh, pr types of uh, things uh, for years. And so that I think. And in fact, that is the one thing that the Biden administration has, has hung on to, is we haven't made any change with regard to China and steel and aluminum or anything else, for that matter, on tariffs. Okay. All right. So you kind of hit on a little bit there, and, and this is the question that people have been asking for, you know, since the start. If, if everything went back to normal tomorrow, uh, you know, well, they stopped the fighting anyway, and they got the ports mm -hmm. back open, and they were, you know, ships are going to be able to come in and out. What, what's the estimate of, of time frame to really be able to go in there, get a, a, a cargo full of wheat or something like that and come back out? Is there, is there any estimates of that right now? No, it'd be just a guess on my part. And, and that yeah. would guess would be probably a couple months. You'd have to clear the mines out of there. And right. that's not a, a thing you could do in a day or two. That's that's for certain. Uh, and then the, uh, there would have to be some level of confidence by the, the ocean vessel owners that they could get insurance Mm -hmm. uh, and be willing to go in and out of there again. So I, I think at a, at a minimum, we're probably talking about a couple of months uh, to, to get things back online. But I think most people's sentiment are thinking, and it's going to be significantly longer than that. Yeah. All right. So uh, yesterday, uh, just for time of reference here, today's the 10th. So uh, I believe the 8th Biden administration passed the, uh, passed the bill to what they were going to no longer bring in Russian uh, oil into the U.S. To, uh, for refining purposes and stuff like that, and you know, you saw some big jumps in um, in crude values as you look across the the spectrum. Um, 
more in the down direction than the up direction when that came out and, and what you saw there. So I guess as you look at that and you're, and you're thinking about um, diesel demand as we go into uh, planning season here in the U.S. and we had this you know, big spike up in, in the price of uh, diesel fuel, what are your thoughts there and how do you think that ripple effect is going to play across profitability, I guess, for the U.S. farmer? Yeah, I, uh, I, <laughs> diesel fuel here on the East Coast is already $5 a gallon. Uh, yeah. I think we're going to see that for quite some time. I th- certainly through the growing season this year, you're going to see diesel fuel that's uh, pretty expensive unless something pretty significant changes. Because th- the issue again is uh, no one is willing to take their vessel into the Black Sea to go get Russian oil. Right. Uh, and and you know whether you could do it and get in and out of there or not uh, without having some sort of problem, uh, no one's willing to take that chance right now. So it isn't just that. You know, it isn't that much uh, oil from Russia that the United States takes. It's the fact that the entire uh, Russian supply chain is offline now for oil uh, for the foreseeable future. And, you know, the the BPs and and some of these other companies that are the refiners, et cetera, they've said, look, we're just not going to go anywhere near it uh, due to reputational risk. We don't want to be associated with being the, the guy that traded uh, Russian oil. I think Shell did it for a little bit. And even they, after, you know, did it for just a second, they said, no, we're not going to do it anymore. Um, and then you have the, the swift financial implications of all of that. Even if you did try to go in and get it, I'm not sure how you would get paid. Uh, okay. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily at some point here that the Chinese won't figure out how to have some sort of uh, operation going with the Russians. And in fact, I would be you know, surprised if they didn't. Uh, so that that potentially would would ease things up a little bit with regard to uh, China's demand for oil. Uh, but uh, the point being, in, until this uh, you know uncertainty subsides, you have an ability to to even have a conversation about getting something in and out of that part of the world in terms of the Black Sea. Uh, these oil prices are going to be up there. You uh, the other issue I would note is done a little homework on fracking in North Dakota and, and mm-hmm. Wall Street Journal's talked about this. It's the same thing that I picked up from talking to these companies is uh, uh, there's nobody to drive trucks up there. There's no steel up there. There's yep. you know, hard to get your hands on sand up there to, to get our domestic production up and running is going to take several months at a minimum, I think, as well. So I think, you know, you've got the price incentive here, but it's just going to take some time uh, to get things and, and get alternatives going. And, and, and by the time you would get that, I would think uh, a huge chunk of our growing season in the U S is going to be over. Yep. Yeah. And that's the, the, the truck driver issue is, is a huge issue for us. Even, even here where I'm at, I mean, just trying to find just truck drivers just to do all equipment around those kind of things. It's getting to be a, a tougher and tougher situation every day. When you look at, um, how natural gas plays in all this, because that's a key component of, of a fertilizer. And you look at where we're at, you know, in the U.S., we're going to start taking some natural gas over to Europe to offset what uh, what they're giving up in uh, as far as Russians, Russian natural gas goes. And, you know, right now the, the price of natural gas is expensive in the U.S., but it's nothing like it is in Europe, right? It's through the roof in Europe. As you take a look at what's going on here, how do you expect that to uh, you know, really have a ripple effect across the price of fertilizer that's already skyrocketing. Yeah, I, I think from my understanding and conversations, you know, the fertilizer has been laid in here in the United States. Uh, mm-hmm. Folks, a lot of folks have priced it. A lot of guys uh, in, the, in the upper half of the Corn Belt put in hydrous on last fall. Uh, what, what's interesting is if you listen to these presentations, and I've sat through a few of them on fertilizer, you know, every supply and demand balance sheet, whether it's urea or anhydrous or li- what I call liquid or whatever, uh, is different. And, and it's they're all really complicated. Uh, they're, you know, before the invasion, I would say that uh, the U.S. still had the cheapest fertilizer in the world, uh, which is kind of hard to believe, <laughs> but it, it seemed to be the case. Uh, for me, though, I, I think the issue with fertilizer is 2023. And, and uh, if you look at uh, what's going on in the world, I think we've got to really understand more about what's going to go on with the potash uh, situation, uh, Ukraine, Russia, and China. You know, what you're seeing on fertilizer is all these countries that, that have it are saying, we're going to take care of our own farmers first. 
and so I think that uh, puts the onus on us in the United States to make sure that we're we're uh, doing a lot better job of of making our own fertilizer here. And I, and I think on the uh, nitrogen side of the equation, I think we can do that. On the phosphorus side, I think there's there's opportunity there. You know, China's a third of the phosphate uh, trade in the world, so you you know we have to see what's going to happen there. But it's the it's the K, it's the potash to me that uh, is, is uh, really gonna be an interesting conversation going forward. We have Canada, but you've got to make sure, I, I don't know what else you have other than that. So you've got to make sure that you, you, you have an opportunity to, to uh, get your hands on uh, what's going on and, and make all of that work. So, so, so I think generally speaking for me on fertilizer, uh, there is a lot of work to be done between now and 2023 on that topic. As you take a look at the relationship between um, China and Russia right now and how that relationship has um, kind of f formulated here, you know, pre-Olympics and post-Olympics, you kind of see China's not necessarily separating themselves from Russia by any means, but they're, sure they're saying some stuff like, hey, maybe we should get together and try to figure out a peace plan and those kind of things. They're, they're trying to separate themselves, but not disassociate themselves with Russia. As you take a look at that partnership right now, what are your thoughts there? Like, what do you, what, when you read the tea leaves, what are your thoughts? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, China will play everybody off against each other to their own advantage. Sure, absolutely. One of the, one of the things that I learned uh, 30 years ago when I first started doing this from an old China hand, who, by the way, we just lost the other day at 94 years old. He was the guy I kind of learned China from first. He said, Greg, always mm -hmm. remember. China will do what is in China's best interest. And if you always, that, that's the answer, whatever the question is. And mm -hmm. I think that's exactly <laughs> okay. what yeah. we're seeing them do right now. Right. Is, uh, you know, if, if it's in their best interest to uh, play uh, the Russians here a little bit to get a pretty big time discount on some crude oil, they'll play that game in, in a way that uh, they come out the winner and nobody else. And so, and, and they'll be very opportunistic about it and they won't really care what anybody else thinks. Yep. That's a, that's a great way to put it because that's, you know, from, that was my next question was talking to you about, you know, this, the China phase one deal and what that looks like. There was some of that, um, that played into that, that felt like there was, uh, you know, Russia or China was going to come to the table when it was, when it was right for them to come to the table and then make those moves as they see, as they see fit. Um, looking back now, that's what you saw now. I didn't really see that with, with, when, when the Trump administration, but what I'm seeing now is China is very much just showing up to fulfill their, the trade once, you know, the phase once deal part of that as it fits their needs, I guess. Well, let me, let me walk you through this deal. Okay. So it was 33 negotiating <laughs> sessions that I spent, uh, and our team spent with uh, my Chinese counterpart, who was the vice minister of agriculture of China, great guy, spoke very good English, had been in the United States, you know, on and off for some 15 years. He's gone on to be the uh, governor of Jilin province now. So he, he's got a big promotion and, and, and I have a great deal of respect for the vice minister. And, and those 33 sessions, hundreds of hours going back and forth on this deal. He had 40 or 50 of the, his best people behind him. I had 20 or 30 of our best people uh, behind me. And we just went at it hour after hour after hour. And what we did was we agreed upon 57 different structural changes in agriculture, fixed problems that we'd had for years. So this wasn't about tariffs. It was, this was fixing all the access for dairy products and beef and, and you name it, every different commodity you can name uh, had some sort of issue getting our products into China. We resolved the vast majority of these issues. We still have some things on biotech and a few other things in that. that uh, so, you know, 53 or four or five of those things are fixed and, and going. So here's the punchline. Did, did the deal really matter? Well, the answer is before we started, we had 1,500 facilities in the U.S. eligible to export ag products to China. Today, we have well over 4,000 facilities eligible to export ag products to China. So we've almost tripled the number of meat processing facilities or infant formula facilities or fruit and vegetable, alfalfa hay processing, you name it. All of those products and facilities had to be approved by the Chinese. There was a, the process wasn't working. 
it was broken, they weren't adhering to it, we got all of that fixed. Uh, and that's made a huge difference. So we, we in, in 2020, we exported 26 billion to China. Last year, we exported $33 billion in ag products to China. But China imports from the world about 160 billion. So we, we still have a huge opportunity to grow this thing uh, beyond what it is today. And, and, and I think China will, but there, to answer your question, they, there was one point made very clear. They're not gonna spend more on US soybeans versus Brazilian soybeans. Our commodities have to be competitive in the world marketplace. And, and to answer your question, did I ever see China or have I seen China since do anything that wasn't uneconomic? No, I think they've been very smart in how they bought uh, things from us and from other countries, quite frankly. Uh, they've they've uh, upheld their side of the deal. Okay. So my next question kind of to that same aspect of that is with what we see happening in in the Black Sea region and stuff in and out there, obviously, you know, Russia can just take stuff right across the border to China. That's, that's not a big deal. But as you look at from a from an, a, a world perspective, how do you think that is going, that China is going to um, pick and choose where they, where they buy stuff from now? Because, I mean, honestly, it doesn't matter where you're buying it from. It's really expensive right now. Well, and, and let's be clear, it's much, much cheaper. Anything going by ocean freight is that almost relative to the cost of the commodity is, isn't that much. But if you have to rail that stuff halfway across the world, that's a huge expense. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, everybody uh, you know, understands that uh, ocean freight is the way to go here and, and uh, you know, trying to deal with all of these issues by rail adds an enormous amount of cost to this and, and it, so that takes it out of the farmer's pocket in uh, Ukraine or Russia, quite frankly, at the end of the day in terms of you know what they're uh, what they get for their commodities. So and, and in terms of China, look, China very much understands that they need more they, they can't buy everything they need without the United States and without US agriculture. China, has emerged as the biggest corn importing nation in the world uh, just in the last couple of years because they've banned the swill feeding of hogs in China. They don't feed pigs food scraps anymore. So they need a lot more corn than they've ever needed before. They're the biggest importer of soybeans. They import 100 out of 167 million tons of soybeans in the world today. They are the huge player in soybeans. Uh, second biggest importer in the world in wheat, biggest beef importer in the world, $10 billion worth of that big pork importer, you, you name it. When it comes to agriculture, they're a huge buyer of this stuff. And uh, so when the U.S. is competitive, uh, they're going to do business with us. They, they understand uh, what we have in terms of agriculture very, very well. Uh, what they don't like about the United States is the fact that uh, we don't uh, cut deals. We don't cut long-term deals. If they're going to buy it from us, they're going to pay what the market uh, says it's worth. And uh, that's, uh, you know, so in, in the cases of things like wheat, we're going to be a lot more expensive than, uh, than black sea wheat. And, and the Chinese very much know that. Yeah. Well, Greg, it's, this is a great conversation and it's, it's awesome to have, that's why I like doing this podcast. I'd like you to come on here and that can, that can enlighten me on things that I, that I read in the news and, and then it kind of give me the, what's really happening on the ground, man. So Greg, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. What's the best way for folks to reach out to you if they have any questions about, about this podcast or what you're doing? Well, uh, they can go on our website, aimpointresearch.com, and uh, track me down that way. And, and, uh, or I think you've got my contact information as well. They can, they can go to you as well. Happy to, happy to visit with folks. And because I will tell you, I've been doing this for 30 some years. I've never seen anything like nobody has what we've gone through yeah. the last couple of weeks here. It's, it's yep. pretty historic. Yep, it is, it is that to say the least. So honored to have you on, man. Good to have a fellow K-Stater and a Kansan on the podcast here. So thanks thanks for being on, man. My pleasure. Thank you. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. 
To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Valley Transportation. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is also brought to you by Ag Direct. No matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving higher in the 21st century.